Water Associates. Thank you for joining our webinar. Uh, today we are presenting Maritime Disasters and Distressed Hospitals, What Every Board Should Know About Assessing Risk. Um, wanted to start with a few housekeeping items. Um, your line will be muted throughout the presentation. If you have any questions uh, for me or for our presenters, you can use your chat function to get in touch. And we will be sending materials within 24, 48 hours after um, the presentation, so you don't need to worry about jotting anything down. If it catches your ear, we will get that out to you. With that, um, I wanted to just do a brief intro on Stridewater Associates, and then we'll get on to our presenters. Um, Stridewater Associates has offices in Atlanta, Nashville, and Portland, Maine. And we are a leading national healthcare consulting firm serving healthcare clients exclusively. We focus on strategic, operational, and financial areas where our perspective offers the highest value. And we're proud of our 32 year history with rural hospitals, community hospitals, large healthcare systems, and large physician groups. With that, I'll give you a little um, backgrounder on our presenters. Uh, Jeffrey Summer in our Portland, Maine office is the practice leader of our capital planning and access practice line and the affiliations and partnership practice. His primary focus is assisting clients with strategy development and the successful execution of business development opportunities. Jeff has advised numerous clients on strategic options, affiliations, and capital planning engagements. Our co-presenter, Ryan Sprinkle, is in our Atlanta office. He is a consultant, and he works with distressed hospitals and other involved stakeholders as those clients consider and implement turnaround strategies. Ryan is an experienced member of our affiliations and partnership practice group, and he is a licensed, but as he says, recovering attorney. Um, with that, I'll turn it over to Ryan at Atlanta, who's going to kick us off this afternoon or morning, depending on where you lie your head at night, and we'll do a couple polling questions. Thank you, Kimberly, and thank you, everyone, for uh, making time in your day to attend the webinar. I know there was a lot of interest uh, leading up to, to this event, and hopefully we'll be able to share some information that's beneficial to, to you all and in, in your organizations. Uh, really, just to help frame our discussion uh, today, we wanted to address a few different topics as it relates to hospitals that find themselves in more problematic areas and the issues that the, those board members and operators have around risk. Specifically, um, starting with how is the sector-specific risk profile of hospitals changing? What, what do we see um, from the macroeconomic and macro-industry level perspective? Uh, what are the underlying sources of this heightened risk profile? And then uh, the parallel here, what lessons can we learn from the El Faro disaster? And we'll talk about that recent maritime uh, incident. Uh, what does the trajectory of a stress to distress hospital look like? We'll provide some observations based upon our work with clients across the country and the problem points they experience uh, depending on their relative level of, of, of stress or distress. And then we'll turn finally to steps that can be taken to help to mitigate these risks. And we'll start with a, a polling question um, that I believe is, has been made available as part of our, our webinar platform. We're gonna close out of that poll, Ryan, and the results. Are you able to see the results, Ryan? I, I cannot see the results. Okay. Um, we have folks representing critical access hospitals at about 32%. Uh, no community hospitals that chimed in or academic medical centers and physician groups at about 11% and other constituents for almost 60%. Well, just to provide some some uh, brief recap of, of the disaster that was the, the El Faro in its last voyage, um, 
on September 30th, 2015, a cargo ship named El Faro left port in Jacksonville, Florida, um, bound for Puerto Rico. At that time, there was a tropical storm Joaquin that was developing, and it would be a part of the El Faro's original um, uh, course. The, the ship's captain, though, aware of, of uh, tropical storm Joaquin, was able to put together an alternative course they thought would allow uh, the El Faro to pass safely to San Juan and miss the destruction caused by this storm. However, 26 hours after they set sail, um, uh, tropical storm Joaquin had morphed into a category three hurricane and the El Faro and its crew sank off of the coast of a Bahamian island. Um, even though they had the advantages of weather forecasts, satellite imagery, and other modern communications, you know, the question persists of how did a disaster like this happen? Uh, we've uh, let, read different articles that provide uh, the text of the, the bridge audio, so we've been able to hear uh, what the captain and, and different mates of the ship were hearing and experiencing during this 26-hour voyage. And some of the, the comments that came out of that bridge audio, we think, uh, provide some application to the problems in the troubled waters that, that our clients uh, see and experience in the operation of, of their facilities. Uh, another storm of sorts that, as, as, as a firm that's exposed to a national platform of clients that, that we've seen emerge over the last several years are disasters for hospitals across the country. So since 2010, approximately 100 and 50 hospitals have closed across the country. Another almost 90 hospitals have sought the protection of, of bankruptcy courts uh, since 2011. So while the overall number of hospital closures and even bankruptcies may seem small compared to the almost 5,000 community hospitals that are across the country, um, it's really from our vantage point, the industry fundamentals and the structural changes that are taking place that make closure or bankruptcy protection to be a, a, a result for many of these hospitals uh, that are experiencing varying levels of distress. And as you can see here, this is just a, a timeline of, short, of sorts to show you the number of closures and the number of hospital bankruptcies across the country. Um, on the left here, we have uh, closures broken out between those that are urban hospitals versus rural hospitals. And then uh, the bar chart on the right just shows you overall bankruptcies across the country. When you look at the underlying fundamentals uh, for the industry, um, one, one good source to get an assessment of, of where the hospital industry sits as a, in terms of its risk profile, profile are from the credit rating agencies, those same credit rating, rating agencies that many of you have probably worked with in different bond issuance. Um, S&P, in their most recent rating of, of the nonprofit healthcare sector, they provided a stable outlook, but they, did, they, they didn't provide that without uh, trepidation. As you can see, they said that uh, health systems continue to do better than standalone hospitals, so a caveat there. Um, one of the leading indicators is that if you, have a, if you are a little bit smaller, you're a little bit more constrained, and you might not succeed going forward. This just really speaks to the additional expense structure that most of our clients have had to bear over the last several years with the implementation of uh, healthcare, uh, electronic health records and uh, the acquisition of physician practices and the compliance with different regulatory requirements. Uh, more broadly though, um, as S&P noted, as we look, look forward, as we look going forward, it's our belief that the sector has peaked. Uh, so from a macroeconomic perspective, we can see that uh, S&P's perspective is that for individual facilities, um, there may be microeconomic opportunities that exist that would allow them to execute and achieve on, on growth opportunities. But for the sector as a whole, and especially those that operate as, as standalone independent facilities, uh, it's, it is definitely troubled waters. Fitch, another crediting agency, provided um, very much similar feedback in their most recent uh, credit outlook for the industry. Uh, as you can see that they summarized here, it just again highlights the need to focus on realizing operational leanness uh, whenever you, know, you see that they noted that there will be continued pressure on margin uh, for hospitals across the country and an erosion in the payer mix 
as uh, the population uh, ages and those uh, patients move on to, to Medicare or other um, government insurance programs. They've also noted that there appears to be growing wage and benefit pressures on the healthcare sector. You know, this, uh, I think most of our clients routinely share with us that the problems they have with uh, retaining, uh, recruiting and retaining good clinical staff, whether it be providers, nurses, or other mid-levels, that will put pressure on your expense structure. Um, the, the item here around the fear on the elimination of the ACA's co uh, coverage expansion while policy uh, perspective at this point appears to be that uh, the ACA won't, won't be repealed and replaced for the foreseeable um, time, uh, that doesn't change the fact that most of the insurance companies that are providing insurance through the individual market are, are doing so with either increasing premiums or they've made the decision to exit those markets, which uh, will have negative implications for, for our clients and the payer mixes that they experience. Overall, in the long term, according to Finch, the sector will be increasingly challenged by regulatory and political uncertainty, the growth in Medicare and Medicaid payers, and meager, meager rate increases. So collectively, uh, uh, pressure on, on margins, the, the compressed margins, and an inability to really combat the cost inflation that most of our clients are experiencing. Ryan, if, if we could pause there, um, I think Kimberly would like to do a couple more polling questions, if that's okay. You're coming right up. Uh, folks should be able to see that on their screens. What category best describes your organization's risk profile today? And there's a series of categories there. All right, that's a good sampling of the people on the phone. So you can see there uh, the breakdown. Looks like most folks are in the moderate category with uh, equal component, slightly less than 20% on stable, calm waters, and also grave risks, all hands on deck. Uh, and then lesser uh, amounts in the improving category. Uh, so pretty pretty wide distribution there of risk profile, uh, self-assessed risk profile. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Jeff. <clears throat> Next so, polling question, uh, Ryan, we want to do another one here as well. Okay. Um, let's see, we'll pull that one up in just a second. While we're waiting for that polling question, one of the lessons we want to make sure we leave with all attendees with is that in our experience, um, the most important thing is, is timely action. Um, and so um, as you think about Ryan's message and later my message, um, keep in mind that timely action is perhaps the most important um, single thing you can do to address and then ultimately alleviate your your risk uh, profile. So this question, how well does your organization understand the sources and nature of its operating risk? Um, what's your level of understanding, in other words, of, of what's driving that risk profile? Folks could respond, that would be helpful. While we're waiting for folks to vote, um, what I would want to do um, is also, I think we'd be remiss if we did not acknowledge that, um, as Ryan mentioned, 33 people did lose their lives in this tra tra tragedy. And um, it's something that's been followed very closely here in our Portland office, 
as a result of, I think, nine of those mariners were, were Maine natives, but also out of the Jacksonville, Florida area where the home port of the El Faro was. So um, the point here is not to make light of the tragedy, but to use it as an example of how risks can get away from folks in positions of authority and responsibility, ultimately with, with very serious, if not tragic outcomes. And we thought that analogy had application to many of the organizations we work with and communities we work in as we travel the country working with hospitals. Um, so the results, it would appear that um, a slightly less than 40% feel they have a very good understanding of the risk profile uh, and what's driving risks. 40% would say somewhat, uh, and then lesser amounts, 10% say not very well, and slightly less than 20% are unsure. Uh, so thank you for that. Ryan, please take us away. And it is consistent off of what the credit rating agencies are seeing, um, you know, just thinking about future projections for, for, for your organization, um, Medicare margins are expected to decline uh, due to that cessation of meaningful use funds and then associated decreases in uncompensated care payments um, under the ACA and its expansion provisions. Um, this really just kind of amplifies the need to, uh, to, to find ways to streamline your operations and improve your, your uh, expense to, to revenue outlook so that you can control for what are projected to be lower revenues moving forward. Um, at the same time that we know that reimbursements at least are directed or are, are moving in, in a, a lower reimbursement, at the same time that we know that reimbursements are projected to, to decline, we also know that patients are increasingly being required to make those first dollar contributions or payments for their healthcare services, you know, whether that be through higher premiums or um, additional out-of-pocket expenses, or in most cases, both. Uh, Patients are increasingly uh, on the hook for their health care services. And all of this is, you know, set against a backdrop of slow wage growth across the country. So health care expenses are, are outpacing the uh, wage increases, which is really uh, hamstringing um, most patients' ability to pay for their health care services. Um, so then the question arises is, you know, how do consumers or patients respond to higher prices and um, a lower ability to pay. Well, I, I think what we're seeing, at least in our practice across the country, is that patients are increasingly start to, starting to act more like consumers. And the market is responding in, in like fashion by offering products and services that really speak to the demands that consumers would expect. And as, we, as you can see here, you know, we have uh, urgent cares versus ERs and the price price differential for those types of services. Um, patients, healthcare patients are, um, are, are looking at the whole host of different um, uh, entry points that they have to use to, to access healthcare services. Um, with, with higher cost and more of their dollars uh, at risk, um, we, we know at least in some of the markets that we work with that you know, whether it be a, a CVS Minute Clinic, or uh, even the, even Walmart has set up its own urgent care inside of some of its store locations. Uh, increasingly, um, hospitals are are being exposed to a, a new a new competitor. Uh, it's no longer physician practices that aren't aligned with with your your hospital or health system, but it's also the retail or convenience care clinics that are also set up in your service areas. Importantly, all of these competitive and regulatory changes are set against the backdrop of, you know, of, of a fundamental shift in the operating model for the hospital business. Um, the new focus now that we've experienced over the last few years on preventative care and wellness, um, that will further reduce inpatient volumes, which, you know, should be a good thing. But as an operator or a hospital board member, um, you still have those existing assets that are in place um, that are being uh, utilized at a lower rate and you have to find a way to, to pay for those facilities. This is a, a full page ad that uh, the Mount Sinai Health System uh, put out 
a year or so ago, and it's it's from their leadership team there that just simply said, if our beds are filled, it means we failed. So it's the realization that um, so much of healthcare is moving out of the hospital setting into these ambulatory care setting sites or uh, centered around the patient home that uh, the operating model, the fundamental operating model has changed. And this just speaks to the, the three different aims that Mount Sinai has indicated that it's seen as being very important to its future operations, um, shifting away from a fee-for-service model, um, operating on a, on, a, on a technology platform through their mobile acute care team, and then the, the focus on preventative care to reduce things like patient readmission. You know, one bright spot, but a spot that still presents some disruption for the industry is the role of technology and what that'll look like moving into the future. Uh, we know that certain technologies can provide greater efficiencies in healthcare. Uh, for example, uh, as we have here on this slide, individualized treatment plans uh, can be put together based on uh, genomics. Uh, and this can remove any redundant or unproductive treatment options and thereby uh, lower the cost of, of the health service to the patient. Um, importantly, uh, other ways in which technology are disrupting the industry, whether it be through telemedicine, which increases the amount of provider coverage that some rural communities may have, or uh, as we're seeing more increasingly, uh, mobile technologies uh, that allow patient consumers to be more involved in, in the focus of the triple aim to make sure that they're being provided the right care at the right place for the right price. Uh, all of these things are, will have some effect on uh, pricing strategies for, for hospital operators and, and the boards that are responsible for governing them. Um, as we see these tools develop and unfold, though, um, it, it certainly becomes a new aspect of, of, a, of a hospital's uh, larger operating strategy, uh, how they can effectively utilize technology to um, better serve their communities. So to, to summarize, uh, overall it appears that the industry is very much in um, unfavorable and unsustainable uh, set of circumstances. Um, technologies, new disruptive technologies, uh, new market entrants that are using new care delivery platforms like urgent cares and other convenient care settings, those, all, all of those things together are having the effect of lowering costs and helping to make patients act more like consumers, which can provide efficiencies to the, to the, to the nation's healthcare market. Um, however, for those individuals that operate or, or govern hospitals, you still have those very high cost fixed assets that you have to pay for it, and you have to find a way to make, utilize, and put to good use for the broader community. Uh, so cumulatively, uh, it, it is certainly a, a set of circumstances where uh, hospital operators and, and boards uh, have to be aware of all of these new dimensions to the healthcare environment and what that means for their, for their operating profile and the risk that they're exposed to. Um, Ryan, we have another polling question we'd like to do uh, now, if that's okay. And we're asking folks to under to um, identify uh, perhaps the, the 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 most significant driver or source of risk, operating risk for their organization. And you can see the categories there. Um, if folks could identify those, that would be um, helpful. Um, while folks are completing that polling question, um, you know, one thing we didn't mention in our list of um, uh, risk factors or risk drivers, um, Ryan, was um, legislative risk or regulatory risk from D.C. And I think um, um, part of that rationale is, A, you know, day by day, it's unclear what the outcome will be, even with the most recent um, um, failure to, to uh, repeal Obamacare and replace it. Um, the key point we want to leave folks with is regardless of what legislative solution comes out of D.C., the economic fundamentals of the federal budget uh, and the industry and overall payment environment remain the same, which is uh, very much of a focus on cost and re re trying to reduce cost growth within the uh, healthcare provider and hospital sectors. So that's, that's going to be a constant. 
So in terms of drivers of risk, um, a third of folks identified federal and state policy and budgets um, tied for first. Last was operation, or excuse me, tied was operational performance, and then equal amounts, competitive environment, and provider relations and recruitment. And lastly, uh, overall general trends in payment and technology in the market. Thank you for filling out the questions. Um, okay, well, um, appreciate that. Ryan, um, let me see if I can, there we go. Um, so bringing us back to our um, um, metaphor, if you will, between a large merchant vessel uh, with modern technology um, and um, hospitals navigating these turbulent times, um, what, what are some of the similarities uh, and, and lessons learned? Um, just like the captain and crew uh, of the Alfaro, um, you, many management teams and boards and providers are increasingly struggling just to keep afloat, um, just to keep on the course you, you think you need to be on. Um, you know, with the benefit of hindsight, um, boy, um, you know, certainly um, many of our clients have said to us is, I really wish we'd had this conversation two years ago. Um, and the same thing is true, certainly in a maritime setting. If you can course correct earlier, the deviation of your original course is less extreme and you can, you can effectively stay further away from the source of risk. Uh, I think that's very true of, of hospitals as well. So identifying a change in environment, identifying um, elevated risk factors um, is really critical uh, to be good stewards, good fiduciaries, good managers. Of, of hospital and health system organizations. Um, one of the things that we would note is um, the old saw that um, if a, a frog is on a, a pot of water that's slowly warming on a stovetop, may not recognize um, in time that the temperature has changed uh, to its own um, potential uh, risk. And I think the same thing is true often with hospitals. The incremental change month to month, year to year, can be something that's easy to miss um, unless you're looking at a longer term trend and looking holistically at uh, a more sources of risk, say, than just volume or just financial results. When you look at the totality of the operating environment, the market environment, uh, and the organizational profile. So that's, that's extremely important. Um, again, we do think there are lessons uh, to be learned from the Alfaro that can, can apply to uh, hospitals today. Um, on behalf of clients, um, this was a client that we were working with that had actually um, um, triggered a bond covenant. Um, and as part of our consulting report uh, to fulfill a requirement of their bond um, covenant and um, uh, obligations, um, we were brought in to do a consultant's report. Um, and we uh, volunteered to them that if they were to put together a dashboard uh, to monitor a series of things, they would have both um, items that were historical looking, um, but keyed up monitor trends, uh, and items that may be more forward looking, um, also looking at key trends um, going forward. Um, and it would be a mix of financial indicators, operating indicators, value indicators, which really get at that change in business model that, that Ryan uh, mentioned previously, looking at covered lives, looking at quality scores. Folks are increasingly paid based upon uh, their quality results. Um, and I think looking at um, the Medicare cost position and whether the organization is able or how close they are able to be break even on Medicare is, is a really critical metric um, just to understand how sustainable the organization is. Many of us and many of our clients have lived off of cost shift and the margins on commercial um, payment. The sustainability of that particular um, um, factor of the industry is is certainly in uh, question. And so um, streamlining operations to be um, uh, break even on Medicare is, is critical. Um, lastly, as we look at market position, identifying market share trends, monitoring those, looking at pair mix trends. Market share is not monolithic. Uh, market share could be remaining somewhat steady, maybe gradual decline. But if you look at your commercial payer base and your, commer and your payer mix is changing, it likely means there may be demographic changes in the market, but more likely you're losing market share on those, those 
patients that sustain the margin and provide the contribution uh, margin you need to sustain the enterprise. Lastly, provider alignment strategies uh, and whether the medical community is being renewed. Is it aging out? Are you able to recruit to the community are critical factors as well. All of those are, are significant risk factors. So our recommendation in terms of managing risk and monitoring risk uh, and being a good leaders and fiduciaries and stewards of these assets and resources is that um, folks should on a regular basis uh, examine a five-year trend line of, of those indicators to understand how are we performing and what is the long-term trend, not a month to prior month, not a month to budget or prior year, but a five-year trend line is really important. Um, and it really should involve um, uh, board, I mean, excuse me, management initially uh, to develop the, um, the um, dashboard and, and diagnose issues, but also at a, at a governance level um, boards uh, as well. Um, lastly, one of the things we'd note, when organizations are on this kind of progression, um, you know, it's, it's pretty easy to identify um, expense reductions. Um, it's important to understand, you know, are the expense reductions being identified one-off reductions and um, they're not systematic and making the organization um, operationally and from a process standpoint more efficient, um, or are they um, uh, things that are one-off that, that may in fact um, uh, compromise the organization going forward, um, not investing in core services, um, equipment, et cetera. Those things can all compromise the lifeblood of an organization going forward. And the type of cuts being done and how they're done often differentiate between organizations that are successful at engaging in a turnaround and an operational improvement plan and those that ultimately are just staving off the inevitable uh, and have an unsuccessful unsuc turnaround. The, um, the next few slides are a bit of a preview uh, of a research report that Stratwater is doing on um, the experience of closed hospitals nationally from 2010 to 2016. Um, we, we're looking at two cohorts, um, the rural cohort uh, and the urban or non-rural cohort. And what we wanted to identify was how do these organizations differ from the industry as a whole? What does the progression from a stressed to distressed to closed hospital look like? And so for these analyses, we're looking at the five years prior to closure um, with T minus five being the five years out from the year of closure, T minus one being the year prior to closure. In this case, we're looking at median volumes um, and change in median volumes in particular as measured by adjusted discharges. Uh, and again, we segregated the closed hospitals into uh, urban as the blue and rural as the orange um, cohort. And you can see volumes were flat for these cohorts in uh, the years five, four, and three, largely um, prior to closure. But there was a significant tailing off in the two years prior to closure. Um, and we can speculate as to the causes of that, but clearly the trend line accelerated as they got closer to uh, um, ultimately um, a fatal um, level of performance. Um, and it takes time for that to develop. Uh, another metric that we've looked at is growth in net patient revenue. Again, looking at the same five-year trend line prior to closure, one of the risk factors that we've always suggested to our clients um, that exists is um, uh, flat top-line revenue growth. It's very difficult to sustain and invest in, a, in a, a clinical platform in an organization that has inherent inflators of cost around staffing, around investment, if top line revenue is flat or declining. And in this case, you can see not surprisingly in the four years prior to closure, uh, declining or flat um, top line revenue. It just becomes uh, very difficult. You can get by year to year making cuts and trying to manage within that constraint. But from a strategic perspective and a competitive uh, perspective, it becomes difficult to sustain and, and keep that uh, enterprise uh, a viable uh, in the long haul when you have that kind of constraint. Um, not surprisingly, when you have flat or declining volume um, and um, flat or declining revenue, you can see ultimately what the results are in terms of net margin. This is median net margin, um, again, five years prior to closure. And you can see that in the urban instance, there's, a, there's an acceleration that occurs uh, over that five years. In the rural, 
Um, and I, I, the, the progression is less profound, but still clearly negative net margin all five years prior to closure. Um, rurals may be cushioned, uh, a significant number of them, because of their critical access status and cost-based reimbursement um, uh, in, in, in how they progress here. But there clearly is a profile and a set of um, risks and performance indicators that do accelerate um, as we look at the five years prior to closure. Um, and we anticipate that study being ready um, later this fall with, with hopefully some interesting findings for the, for the industry as a whole. Um, Ryan and I and some of our colleagues have kind of developed this um, progression of um, performance that leads an organization of being relatively low risk and stable to one that has a heightened risk profile um, and needs to take action to mitigate those risks and steer away from it um, to an organization that has fewer options and is in dire need and dire risk of being significantly constrained, damaged, or ultimately um, forced to close or file for bankruptcy. And where we really um, want to try to shift people's perception is that it, it's really critical that folks um, start to try to maneuver and take action before you're in that red zone. So ideally, uh, as you enter, first enter the stressed um, um, part of the continuum the, that's still blue, that's really where you wanna take um, action and work on um, course correction and improvement and looking at operations and um, trying to um, uh, have a tidy ship that's moving um, um, in, in a very, um, secure way through turbulent seas. Um, the key metrics there that we would suggest you look at are, um, of the five prior years, how many of those years did the organization come um, close or, or exceed uh, budgeted levels of performance? Um, in the two years uh, previous, has the organization had um, a positive margin and adequate cash flow to make investments and fund its capital uh, needs. If the answers to those are unsatisfactory, you're clearly not on a sustainable track and there needs to be some significant um, but, but manageable course correction and action taken. As you move along the progression to three years of negative margin and more years of being unable to invest, um, your room to maneuver becomes constrained. You have fewer resources and the degree of correction accelerate significantly. So um, that, that's how I think you want to look at this as a continuum of risk and a continuum of actions that management and boards need to take um, with more severe steps, uh, a larger course correction being required as you move along that progression. Um, so again, slide 21 looks at this progression um, and identifies some of the key indicators and warning signs. And then describes um, management actions as uh, navigation app actions or options uh, to use our metaphor um, again. Um, clearly, um, taking early action is critical. In the case of the El Faro, um, it could have saved the vessel and all lives on hand. And in the case of the 150 to 160 hospitals that have closed over the last six or seven years, uh, certainly that outcome and in some of those, if not many of those instances, could have been avoided uh, with earlier action. As we move through the progression, you can see um, that this is a more uh, digestible format. Um, a, there's a longer trend line here in terms of the years of negative uh, margins, uh, the uh, severity of cost-cutting measures, and um, yes, folks are cost-cutting to meet budget and perhaps avoid uh, uh, triggering a bond covenant violation. But at the same time, what they're doing is in future years, compromising uh, the organization and, and um, raising constraints to future success. And those are the trade-offs that folks want to be aware of. You're solving a short-term problem, but you're making the long-term um, risk profile and performance uh, of the organization, putting that at risk as you move forward. So um, as we um, think about um, the El Faro and the hospital industry, we wanted to kind of come back to um, some of the lessons, and we do think these um, apply, and the metaphor actually is, is helpful. Um, the NTSB, National Transportation Safety Board, has issued a set of recommendations, um, and um, 
one of their recommendations was that the forecasting that was available to the captain and crew of the El Faro was inadequate. There were some communication issues and some technology issues, but the actual forecast and how frequently it was updated and how accurate it was has been called into question. So um, one of the things they've said is obtaining up-to-date accurate information and taking appropriate action is really important. Um, so you can see here in terms of the, um, the recommendation that waiting too long to assess options and change course increases risks and frankly reduces your room for maneuvering, reduces your strategic options. So that regular review of options and a timely intervention is critical. Again, the most common um, uh, regret we hear from clients is, man, I wish we'd had this conversation two years previously. Um, and so I think that's a real lesson for folks to, to um, understand. We, want, we have one last polling question we wanted to share, uh, and then we have a few more slides. Um, as you think about the strategies and initiatives available to you, um, what do you think is the one that is um, uh, most useful and most likely to be used for you to mitigate risks? And we've got a, a set of uh, options there um, for you to um, vote on, if you could. All right, we'll leave that open for a few more seconds here. We're getting to a little approaching 50% voting. Terrific. Um, thank you. You can see here the results. A quarter were focused on expense reduction, 60% uh, uh, identifying growth opportunities, responding to competition, 50% um, uh, talking about improving revenue cycle performance and cash realization, and a third looking at um, improving physician practice performance. Clearly, there are other initiatives uh, that organizations focus on. These are four of the most uh, common and uh, prevalent that, that we see uh, in our clients grappling with things. I think one of the things I would say looking at these results um, is I'm gratified that folks have a balanced approach here and that folks are looking at growth opportunities and revenue opportunities, both in terms of uh, how they compete in the market, but also in terms of how they capture and realize revenue within their internal revenue cycle processes. I think that's positive. Expense reduction, um, uh, I think is an important tool, um, but um, it's, it's a balanced approach that needs to be done. One of the things I would note, we're increasingly seeing in our, our clients that their uh, employed practices have become a, a really uh, increasingly acute source of uh, operational stress. Uh, as hospital margins have been squeezed, the ability to uh, sustain practices that um, are on their standalone basis uh, losing significant amount of operating um, cash flow or uh, income uh, becomes a, a, a increasingly unsustainable um, situation, one that needs to be addressed. So thank you for those results. Um, so again, thinking about takeaways for hospital leaders, um, National Weather Service um, was suggested, again, from the NTSB recommendations, that the way that they develop and uh, distribute their cyclone forecasts hurricane forecasts and advisories um, is really important for folks to better understand and respond in a timely way to those risks. Um, so our uh, metaphor would be to say that an objective um, analysis of risk factors, one that looks at that five-year timeline and only is modified to improve um, the metrics that you're looking at, as opposed to just uh, cherry-picking those metrics that are positive. I think it's important to have some continuity year to year uh, in that um, set of analyses is really uh, important. Um, and the organization does need to understand, do we remain on our current trajectory or is it time to understand, should we examine other options? Um, that's a conversation that can be very difficult, but it's prudent to have. And the ability to have that conversation regardless of the outcome is really increasingly um, critical for organizations who want to remain healthy and viable going forward, given the risk environment. Um, so one of the takeaways here uh, is that the El Faro encountered a storm that was stronger than forecast and not where they thought it would be. So they didn't have good information. 
arguably, um, and I think the NTSB and, and um, others have indicated that they didn't feel that the captain um, of the vessel and the owners of the vessel took appropriate action to manage risk and steer uh, away from the storm. As you read the blow by blow of the um, transcripts from the bridge and the uh, 36 hours leading up to the tragedy, um, it's clear that folks didn't appreciate, whether it was the company or the captain or others, that uh, a modern vessel, vessel um, could be overcome by events and, and might not have appropriate information to take appropriate action. Um, they lost propulsion when their list, that is how the vessel was tilted, compromised the oil to the boilers, uh, the lubricating oil, and so the boilers then shut down. Uh, the propulsion system then shut down. And at that point, they significantly compromised their ability to pump water uh, from the leaks they had, uh, and they lost the ability to maneuver in a storm, which is critical to success. The analogy for um, hospitals is um, there are events that can occur um, as you um, um, face increased competition and challenging um, performance um, that can overcome your ability to respond. As an organization becomes more challenged, um, do medical groups that were aligned uh, and good referrers begin to look elsewhere uh, to refer their cases? Um, is it increasingly hard to recruit and retain key staff and key providers? Those types of things that are kind of secondary events from compromised financial operating clinical performance can provide a feedback loop that can um, really intensify the risk profile and the organizational difficulties that um, hospitals and health systems face. So you need to keep those in mind. How, how are those risk factors likely to be amplified as we move through um, these stormy waters? Um, good data and analysis are necessary, but are insufficient without decisive and timely uh, action by those navigating and responsible for the ship. Uh, the ship being your, your hospital. Um, so as we think about organizations, and a number of you indicated you had moderate risk profile, I think that was the most common result from the prior um, polling question. You really want to think about where you are on this continuum and what are the prudent steps to take. Um, and as you move from stressed to distressed, um, that really becomes a key tipping point. You really move from a situation where your course correction may be less extreme and less disruptive to the organization, uh, and, and frankly, with a, an entirely different risk profile. Once you get into the distressed category, even the earlier phases of distressed category, the um, um, degree that you need to change course and the degree to which you need to impact the organization to get things back on track raises a set of uh, risks that the organization is going to have to deal with. Um, your options to get back on track are also constrained there. So there's a heightened risk that events may overtake you as you look to um, move forward. One of the things that we would um, urge everyone to consider um, as you think about this continuum is what are the opportunities we have? available to us to change the trajectory of the organization. Um, one of the things that we will be making available to folks um, who participated in this webinar is an action plan. Um, and it's, it's basically a checklist, if you will, um, that provides um, some guidance on uh, to management as to what are the types of things we should be thinking about that can help us uh, address the, the acuity of risk we're facing and change course. Uh, some of them are listed here. Um, so understanding how you perform relative to peer groups and cohorts on key operational and cost indicators uh, is important. Uh, revenue cycle, um, the, the complexity of revenue cycle operations in their entirety is such that we, we don't encounter um, uh, organizations that wouldn't benefit from additional help in this space. Um, uh, our colleague who does this work um, is yet to, to find an organization that can't benefit from um, um, additional resources and assistance in terms of all aspects of revenue cycle. You may have a, just done your charge master, but there may be aspects of denial management or other aspects of um, 
um, uh, the revenue cycle, whether it's point of service collections, et cetera, that are lagging. So that's an important area. Pricing analysis. We're always surprised when we're, we enter a market and we have access to pricing information on commercial contracts. And Florida is an example of a state where there's public databases that share this information. And the, the, the extreme disparities in organizations and their pricing um, is one that is um, really important to understand. How do you compare to peers? Oftentimes this can be obtained uh, and benchmarked on a gross charge basis. Um, and adjusted for, for case mix index and wage uh, uh, costs. Um, but it's really important to understand how you perform. A, because more and more patients are paying out of pocket as they go forward. Another tool that's available to folks and critical is really understanding as you get into that distressed space, understanding what your cash flow looks like and how you can manage cash flow so that you can create some room to maneuver, some navigation room as you take corrective action to improve operations. So having a really good understanding of, of and projection of cash flow can make, be the difference between ending up uh, on the rocks, so to speak, and navigating safely um, and avoiding the, the risks at hand. Um, Ryan, did you um, want to share with some folks um, thoughts on the, the first three bullets on this slide? Absolutely. Um, so when you're looking at your organization and your current standing um, relative to, to the risk that may exist, it really is important that you understand and you monitor what those risk factors are. Um, we've identified some of those during the course of the presentation today. We'll be sending out follow-up material to everyone after in the next handful of days that speaks more definitively to some of those factors that we see as being ongoing sources of risk that should be assessed at least annually. Um, but, but knowing what those are and then in the, almost in the back of your mind as an operator, routinely returning to those to see how you're doing, not just on an annual basis, but, but quarterly is, is really important, especially if you find yourself in really troubled waters. Um, distilling this information into the form of an, of an annual uh, dashboard uh, can be essential to, to see how that risk relates to your overall financial, operational, and, and value perspective as well as what that means for your position in your market and any competitive risk that you're posed with there. Uh, and then this dashboard really should be a part of any annual board discussion that you have about the organization, its strengths and, and relative weaknesses, and its performance in year prior relative to you know, the past five years. One of the things that, that's notable, I know Jeff and I have sat through these client meetings before in the past uh, during the, the review of the, the annual um, the, the audited financial statements for the prior year, most of most of those presentations only provide really limited optics into the year prior or, or two years prior's performance. And for, for most of our, our board clients, they've really lost the ability to see how the prior year's performance related to the longer uh, historical trajectory. So incorporating this dashboard into a, a portion of this annual board meeting, um, making it stand up on its own accord relative to the past five years of, of the facility's uh, experiences really is important uh, to help you understand where you are, monitor where you're going, and then make sure that you're well positioned to change course and put forward those course correcting strategies as needed. That's great. <clears throat> Thank you, Ryan. Um, and I, I, I just want to echo that comment. Um, you know, it is always surprising to us when we do our type of analysis and provide that kind of five-year historical review and drill into some of the key indicators, um, the light bulbs that go off and on um, uh, around the board table, that folks are almost seeing the information for the first time. And they've had the information, but it hasn't been put in a format that leads to an understanding of how the risk environment has changed over time. Um, so, you know, the next three bullets really speak to uh, a balance between um, being very pragmatic and focused on the business enterprise uh, and cash is king and margin is critical to sustaining the mission. Um, so being able to monitor and understand what your cash position is and what factors are likely to impact that both uh, in a beneficial way and in an adverse way is critical. Um, and so, you know, as you get further along that distressed um, 
um, trajectory and, and continuum, liquidity issues often raise their head. Um, this is, an or, is a business that's capital intensive. Uh, it's a business that has um, declining and weak margins, and you're often at the risk of uh, payers for, um, um, that are at the end of a very complex uh, coding, charging, and revenue collection process. So liquidity issues are, are often key, and having a really good handle on rev cycle and uh, cash projections is important. Taking timely action, um, there is no single factor that I think we would identify as um, that puts an organization at risk uh, more than um, the inability to address risk, discuss risk, and address it at the management level and board level and take action in a timely way. Those are not pleasant conversations, but they're a heck of a lot easier when you're doing it, when you've still got room to maneuver and more options available to you, including looking at just some operational performance uh, levers as opposed to things that are much more tumultuous to an organization once you get into that distressed uh, mode. Um, lastly, an appreciation that the risk environment is dynamic. Um, it's often easy for folks to say, my gosh, the hospital has been here for 30, 50, 120 years. Um, I don't understand what's changed. A lot of the things that are increasing the risk uh, confronting hospitals and health systems today are out of sight. Um, you know, the 24-hour the, the news cycle focuses on what's happening in D.C. That is a risk factor, but the fundamentals that underlay that debate um, are really the drivers of risk, and those are not forgiving and are not going to uh, uh, mitigate over time. What folks need to do and leaders need to do of hospitals is position their organizations for success in the long term. And that's looking at that value equation, looking at how you can compete to provide services, uh, looking at how that service mix is evolving and changing as a result of technology and payments and, and all of those uh, factors. Uh, so appreciating that the risk environment is extremely dynamic even in markets where you may be the sole provider, even in markets where the demographics are stable, past success is not an indicator of future performance. Um, so the ability to understand that the risk environment is dynamic, the ability to have those conversations in a timely um, uh, way allows you to take a much more gentle course correction to the organization, one that doesn't put the organization in danger and one that allows you to look at more options, including uh, various uh, levers of operational improvement that may not be available to you or may not be sufficient if that conversation is put off. Um, so that's the, the um, uh, totality of our webinar. We do have, it looks like, a few minutes for some questions if folks want to submit questions, I understand. Sure. Um, we had several questions, and there's kind of a theme there, um, two-pronged. Why do leaders fail to see these signs, what, you know, in your experience? And the second part of that is, are they actually ignorant of the signs, or is it kind of an ostrich situation where they don't want to see what reality is? I think in most instances, it's a combination of the two. It's not explicit avoidance or malfeasance in any way, but I think it's human nature to avoid difficult conversations. Um, board members don't necessarily want to raise what might be a very controversial or sore subject to their fellow peers. Management may be reluctant to bring the issues to the board um, because they don't want to uh, see as messenger that they get shot and they want to be seen as part of the solution. That's an element to it. It's more complex than I've just alluded to, but that's one component of it. Too. I, I honestly do think the second component is just like in the El Faro, the forecasts are not as accurate. The information isn't available. Um, and so the folks on that bridge and that vessel thought they had up-to-date forecasts. They didn't. They were more dated and they were more inaccurate. I think uh, senior management often doesn't have the information available. Uh, and I think boards often don't have the information available. And so dedicating the time and the resources to get that information uh, and provide it in an organized um, way 
annually so that they, you can have a discussion around those risk factors and what the trajectory is, is really critically important because that will trigger uh, a conversation uh, and, and allow folks to um, take action. All right. Uh, thank you, Jeff. That takes us to just about the top of the hour. Um, so we'd like to thank you on behalf of my colleagues in um, our Nashville office in Atlanta and here in Portland, Maine. Thank you so much for taking time out of your day today. And we will be following up with you within the next couple days with um, materials from the presentation. Thank you.